Ed DeRosa back with you for Horse Racing Nation. Join just down the road, really. We're both in Oldham County as we talk. Brandon Staubel of Churchill Downs and Brandon uh, September meet. Somewhat new to the Kentucky racing landscape, but already making a, a pretty big mark with these stakes races that we've seen. The kickoff to the Derby with the Iroquois opening week. Already closing week for the short meeting, but uh, going to go out with a bang with a mandatory payout Sunday and a pair of graded stakes Saturday. It's been exciting at Churchill. It really has been for the last couple of years. We mentioned a couple of stakes races coming up, uh, $300,000 for the ACAC, -AC, and uh, that, that's a great three. So, I mean, it's going to lure some good fields and um, just a, a great product at Churchill Downs right now. And then also, uh, just to mention, a, a lot of uh, full field maiden races that make for good betting races. So, I'm uh, just really excited to uh, be able to be a part of that, uh, being in the paddock, being able to also kind of give some workout observations as well and uh, try to bring some info to the fans and hopefully cash a few tickets. Yeah, and uh, obviously uh, I'm used to from our time actually working together in the moment, but also in recent weeks know that uh, Brisnet uh, has a new product with the uh, folks at Trip Notes Pro that you have uh, also contributed to. And as Kentucky racing gets bigger, I have to imagine we're going to see more and more of, you know, maybe even new training centers pop up. But I think certainly, you know, whether it's Skylight, Mercury, Trackside, uh, the training center at Keeneland, a lot of different outposts coming into church. Obviously, you can't be at all of those places in the morning, but you do get to see them in the paddock. And what are some of the clues uh, that, you know, just as a visual handicapper as well, someone who knows how to read the form and watch a race, but what, what do you look for when you see them come through that tunnel and uh, lay eyes on them for maybe not the first time, but the first time in a race setting when talking about these maidens? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I like to do is I like to kind of go over uh, by the tunnel and kind of catch all of them as soon as they their first steps uh, into the ring and headed into the paddock to get scanned, get their chip scanned. Um, I kind of look for a presence a little bit. Um, horses also that are maybe a little hot, a little worked up. I'll kind of note that a little bit, but more of a presence than anything, especially with the uh, younger horses, you know, that they've they've kind of done this before. They, they at least act like they've done this before versus maybe some that are kind of dancing on the toes or, uh, you know, bucking and playing a little bit. So the presence first off, and then uh, once they kind of get settled in and start to walk around a little bit, what I like to do is kind of measure up um, a particular horse against uh, the rest of the field. So I might check out the hind end, you know, how fit does this one look? Is it have a big hip, small hip, uh, depending on what kind of uh, race we have, uh, whether it's sprint route, those kind of things. Take a look at the shoulder. Uh, you know, a big shoulder is good. Um, but the biggest thing really is that presence in the paddock, a nice uh, overstep when they're walking, just kind of a smooth mover out there. It's the same thing you're kind of looking for at the sales. But uh, once you see it in the paddock, it's that confidence, that smooth movement. Um, and, and then the fitness level, too. Um, if you kind of look underneath um, the, the belly area is one thing I like to look at. That's usually will tell you how fit a horse is. Sometimes if they come in um, a little heavy, you can say, oh, maybe this one needs a race. But um, that's another area, too, that um, I definitely want to check out when they come in. As you said, uh, plenty of uh, young horses, a big part of the uh, September meet. And I know we'll see plenty more come November with those stars of tomorrow cards and uh, some additional stakes races as well. And speaking of stakes, the Kentucky Derby winner is back beneath the Twin Spires. He's run twice since his big upset, two losses in New York. Everyone has been saying the Travers showed a step forward for the Derby winner. I'm mixed on that, admittedly. Uh, I feel like that was a race maybe he could have at least gotten second if we really thought he was to a next level where he won't be a, an outsider in these types of races. But – Figure-wise, unquestionably, he moved forward. Ragazin, Bayer, Brisnet, all of those have him running a lifetime best. I am not familiar with how he's trained. I know he schooled at the paddock today. He's been at Churchill for the last few days. I'm definitely very much looking forward to hearing everyone's impression on Saturday when he actually comes to the paddock. This seems like a race he has a better chance to win than his last two. Yeah, I agree. Um, when I went through this race, um, you know, at first, everybody kind of thinks, oh, that big upset. And that kind of sticks in your mind. And, and that happens a lot in racing where we kind of look back and say, oh, that was a fluke. And, uh, you know, he can't do that today. But, you know, things have changed, like you mentioned, uh, whether it's the sheets or 
or, or speed figure services um he's moved forward a little bit and i'll just mention too that was the first race off of a couple month layoff the other thing was that the the saratoga track in general it's a very deep track but i've heard that horsemen this year particularly said it was the deepest track they've ever seen at saratoga so to come off of a couple month layoff and and run a pretty good race up there uh, I, I thought that said a lot. So uh, moving forward, uh, second start off of the layoff. He, we know he loves Churchill two for two uh, with that big race in the Derby. Uh, likely to never see that kind of pace like you saw in the Derby again, especially early on. Yeah, I but, was thinking uh, about the pace for this race. Uh, there is mm -hmm. some, but like, I mean, not like that. Yeah, I mean, he's going to have to um, either uh, Sonny Leone's going to either have to get Rich Strike into the race a little bit earlier or they're going to have to um, move early or, or something, whether it's out of the gate or on the backside, uh, just to kind of get him going. Or maybe they just say, look, we're going to we're just going to make our one run like we always do. But um, I'm sure that that's something that's always going to be in the back of Eric Reed's mind. But uh, there should be some pace in here. See, um Hot Rod Charlie um, on paper to me seems like the quickest of the quick. I know our collector's got plenty of speed, but uh, his two races this year are talking about our collector. Uh, the paces have been um, somewhat on the slow side, just looking at some pace figures versus Hot Rod Charlie's been running uh, quicker pace figures. I think if if Tyler Gaffleone really wanted to get the lead, Rod Charlie, I think he could get it. But um, I kind of see more of the opposite here where they'll uh, kind of try to save some energy with Hot Rod Charlie, maybe let our collector go and then just sit right off of his hip and uh, kind of go a little bit easier than he did the last couple of times chasing uh, life is good uh, in particular uh, last time. And uh, the, ha I keep wanting to say super saver, happy saver. Mm -hmm. One of three that Pletcher is running this weekend in breeders cup prep races. The other two in the Woodward really seems to not run a bad race. And uh, we'll talk about speaker's corner in the ACAC, -ac, but happy saver actually came much closer to flight line and I believe has become the closest of any horse to him. I don't say that like he ever had a chance to win the Met Mile, but he has come the closest. To me, he's the horse to beat in this race, depending on what happens with the pace. Maybe Rich Strike is running late, but Hot Rod Charlie, is, he's tough to trust at another short price. He has losses on his page at 1-5 to five and 3-10. to 10. He won't be odds on here, but at the expected prices, I, I think Happy Savers has shown a little more grit. Yeah, I would agree. He's faced, um, you know, what you would call superior competition also uh, was in that race with Hot Rod Charlie last time, uh, flight line before that, Olympiad when he was really good. And then even going back to the Clark last year, just beating a half length of Maxfield. Um, you know, the biggest thing for me is um, he kind of always finishes on the wrong lead and he just always kind of teases you like he's always going to get there and he never does. Um, those the horses for me, uh, particularly, I know he's I know he's getting a drop in class here. They're just hard for me to gauge sometimes, especially on the wind side. Uh, definitely a horse I could, you know, an exact as I could key in second and feel pretty good about it. Um, He's got the figures. He's got the back class. Um, it's just, I guess, more mentally, does he want to seal the deal? He just kind of always seems to kind of grind up there. I will say, too, I mean, he um, kind of sat behind that pace last time that was, you know, somewhat hot early on. But uh, I thought Hot Rod Charlie kind of did more of the dirty work up there near the pace. And, um, you know, there was only a head that separated those two. So uh, for me, um, I would probably side more if we were going on like a head to head matchup more with hot rod, Charlie than uh, happy saver. I would, I'll, in the multi race <laughs> wagers, you can't really let the board decide. You have to take a stand somewhere. For me, it would come down to if one is clearly being bet more than the other, I would go with the one not being bet. Uh, but I do think both of those two are in my mind more likely than rich strike. But I will say if there were head-to-head -head with Ritz Strike and Art Collector, I'd take the Derby winner. Yeah, I, I was laughing there because I thought you were going to say, uh, once I took Hot Rod Charlie over Happy Saver, maybe you were going to bet a bourbon at uh, no. Barn 8 on it. <laughs> so, no, that I agree. I mean, overdue. Yes, it is. Uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think um, once you kind of get past the logicals, um, I mean, Rich Strike to me is very interesting. Uh, Multi-race bets. He's definitely going to be on my ticket and, uh, you know, just a little bit of a forward move off of that race. You know, I mean, Epicenter, obviously Flightline is going to be the one to beat in the classic, but Epicenter has done really nothing wrong. And I mean, you get rid of Flightline, I mean, possibly Epicenter 
might be the top horse as a three-year-old. So he ran into him. I mean, Cyberknife wasn't disgraced. So I, I think Rich Strike has a lot of positives in his corner. Yeah. And uh, we're talking about a race that has an 80 plus to one upset winner of the Derby. So you never want to be dismissive of other horses, but King Fury and Chess Chief, definitely the, in my mind, the least likely winners of this group. Definitely agree there. Um, speaking about King Fury, just kind of disappointed, I guess, in a way. I really liked his work before the Derby last year. Ultimately, he had to scratch. I just thought he had a lot of talent. He trained with a lot of talent. He still trains very well, but it just hasn't kind of made that forward move. And uh, last time, just really no excuses. I mean, he would be a, a major surprise to me in here. And then kind of the same thing with Chess Chief. I mean, he got um, decent down at the fairgrounds a little bit, um, kind of shows up for these big races, but clearly mm -hmm. just a, a cut below. But, um, you know, I mean, talk to Dallas all the time, and he just always talks about, you know, that's how Lucas – won all his races. He wasn't afraid to show up in, in races and run. And so uh, give them credit for that. Uh, but as far as wagering goes, I, I will definitely be passing on those two. Yeah. And I, I mean, with chess chief, uh, you know, you look at his numbers and depending on what type of allowance was written and, and who's in the, the back looking for a tightener or a race off the layoff who might show up, he's unlikely to be favored in, you know, upper level allowance races for 125,000. So, I mean, why not take a shot to be, to be fourth for, you know, even big, bigger money. Uh, I get it. And, you know, Dallas certainly learned from the best in that regard in the coach, but yeah, they, they would either would be a surprise to me uh, gun to my head. I'd have happy saver on top, but if he ended up being chalk and hot rod, Charlie were, you know, clearly the second choice, I'd be willing to flip there. And then, you know, I think Rich Strike over our collector, um, you know, it, it, it's a pretty chalky three out of six. So that's half the field. But I think there are ways you can kind of play around with, you know, straight numbers to maybe extract something vertically with, with Rich Strike in there. But, uh, you know, more than anything, it should be a good race. Yeah, I think so for a field of six. And as we mentioned, uh, we kind of see it. Maybe there's uh, two that you can kind of toss uh, just to mention to Chess Chief 0 for 12 at Churchill, just kind of another uh, reason that uh, that would be tough to see. Maybe a prep for the Clark here also kind of maybe thinking that uh, there's another goal down the road. I think um, as we talk about this pace scenario, Savers no slouch in the pace department. He's got some good pace numbers. It'll be interesting to see what Johnny B does. Um, kind of knowing that um, there's two pace players in here, in particular, our collector and uh Hot Rod Charlie, do we just sit behind, let those two ding dong, or, or um, maybe he catches a good break and he wants to go on with it. The pace gets a little bit hot up front or contested, sets up really well for Rich Strike. Yeah. Well, part of the fun for sure, and uh, definitely having the, the Derby winner going in the right direction, showing up for this race. Uh, my colleague, Ron Flatter, unearthed uh, some numbers. This is the first time a Derby winner has returned to Churchill Downs is a three-year-old since Dust Commander, which was 1970. And should he win, he'd be the first Derby winner to win another race as a three-year-old at Churchill in, I think it was something like 100 years. So wow. uh, pretty rare to, to show back up here. And uh, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see how it goes. So um, the ak, ak won't spend quite as much time, although it is a deeper field, but certainly Speaker's Corner, who was the uh, option du jour against both flight line and life is good. And uh, really had in my mind, no response for either of those two, uh, you know, John Embriel did his best on Belmont day to make it sound like some battle was going to form turning for home. And I mean, flight line disposed of, of speakers corner with devastating ease as Tom Durkin would say. And then didn't show up at all in the Pat O'Brien at 11, at 11 to 10. Outside post or not, and he gets to move to the rail here. That was just too bad of a performance for me into a slow pace to back him here as the favorite, giving weight to everyone else. I completely agree. Um, you know, we do the uh, signature plays. He's going to be my, at Churchill Downs, we do uh, those plays, and he's going to be my favorite against um, – uh, very like disappointing. It. Yeah, I, Taglia <laughs> made him even money. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, very disappointing last time. And and look, there were no world beaters in there either. Um, slow fractions. 
can totally make the argument uh, if you're on the other side that uh, the ship out there maybe you know there's always excuses about shipping out west and coming back and um, but bill mott i mean he comes back and uh, works him three times starting back on september 9th and and still kind of tries to tighten the screws a little bit more one of the things I, I kind of have against Speaker's Corner is I just wonder if he's kind of he's done a lot this year going back to even uh, the Discovery and then uh, had some big races down at Gulfstream. He's just run some fast, pretty fast numbers. And is he starting to tail off a little bit as we reach the end of the year? Uh, I know on um, on on Rag is in. He, he kind of looks that way a little bit. Uh, other sheet figures, probably the same thing. Just, start, you know, we're starting to tail off a little bit from the rail. Function, uh, possibly uh, mailman money, even Twilight Blue a little bit. I think he's going to probably get maybe a length or so lead up top, but it's uh, that one turn mile at Churchill is very tough. And I think there's some interesting horses in here that are that are stepping forward a little bit and, and can definitely make some noise. Yeah, I definitely like that uh, there's some, you know, I think mailman money, who's a long shot, and Twilight Blue drawn outside. I mean, if they're in the race to have any – if they're in the race with instructions of yeah, we're going to go for it, we want to win. They have to, they have to go early. Right. So that I think hurt Speaker's Corner, who according to Brisnet, that was a slowish pace he set in the Pat O'Brien, and he still folded as the big favorite. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm with you on a, on a favorite against. Uh, I thought three technique and Senor Buscador, Buscador, uh, both closers. Uh, Senor was actually in front of. Um, speaker's corner in the Pat O'Brien, he passed him late and still gets four pounds from that one. So I kind of thought that was interesting in here for the one turn mile for him. Uh, and then three technique has a, is a big, big win, uh, at the track at a big, big price, uh, in the next go and look a neck behind Cody's wish to me, that's certainly no slouch in the company line department, uh, coming here at Churchill at this, uh, route and distance. So they're both 12 to one on the morning line. And, you know, I, I see re really no reason to sort of mince between them. I'm going to use five and eight is A's and the, uh, the multi-race wagers. Completely agree with you on uh, three technique. He um, more than likely is going to be my top selection in the race. Um, he had the lead against Cody's wish uh, coming for home. And then Cody's wish, I just outgamed him, came back on late, and obviously Cody's Wish came back and and ran, won a grade one out of that race at Saratoga. So uh, I don't mind that so much. I mean, if it would have been a lesser horse where he kind of uh, let him come back on, then kind of hold it against him. But look, this horse, Cody's Wish, is, is really nice, obviously. Um, and I kind of like what Jason Cook's done here um, when you kind of look at this horse's pattern on the sheets. Um, giving him a little bit of a break here off of a kind of a big effort and uh, fresh into this race. Um, he does need a little bit of pace. It appears on paper and I think he'll, he'll get that pace in here. Um, and especially at that price, if we're anywhere in that 12 to one, maybe even eight to 10 to one, uh, definitely interested in, in three technique. He just um, always kind of seems to show up, especially lately. Uh, I will mention um, a couple other ones in here. Yeah, so please do. Uh, I, I would say the fact that we both, pick three technique or I, you know, one or one a probably means we won't get 12 to one, but <laughs> I just, it's a 10 horse field and there's an even money morning line. We have to get at least eight. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe six, eight to one, uh, yeah. but def definitely in the multis though, he's going to play bigger than that. Uh, just because, I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, that usually just kind of find a place to single the favorite they'll single speakers corner in here versus, the way I'm going to play it is I'm probably going to toss speaker's corner and, and then try to get a price. Yeah, uh, number three, Folsom. I'll just mention um, uh, this one always has trained well. He's training as good as ever um, from what I've seen in the mornings. And um, surprisingly, he's never been a one turn mile. He's actually he's been a mile before, but not the one turn mile. I kind of like his style too. Um, last time he just kind of kept finding more, but he's kind of got that grinding style. Uh, it's been successful around two turns, but uh, that style does really well at the one turn mile. Also, uh, Flo will have to work out a trip, but uh, he definitely, I think, will run big in here. I was also interested in uh, the number two untreated who um, has success at a one turn mile uh, at Aqueduct. They tried to stretch him out a little bit. He's gone a mile and three sixteenths and, and then back to back mile and a quarter races. He should be dead fit in here. Another one that um, 
is uh, going to need a trip from the inside, but I thought uh, untreated definitely uh, needed to be respected in here. Other than that, uh, you know, those are the three I kind of want to play around with a little bit. Um, Twilight Blue is interesting to me, uh, except, you know, just being kind of being a workout guy. I mean, to give you a little little inside info that uh, on the 17th, um, kind of got outworked a little bit by Scarlet Fusion, who I uh, believe is entered to, uh, we're recording this on Thursday, so entered uh, on Friday at Churchill. Um, so I would have liked to have seen a little bit more, I guess, from a horse like that, but uh, could be that maybe he's not the greatest workhorse, but, uh, you know, that's just something I'll kind of be in a visual workout guy. I'll probably downgrade Twilight. I'll still use Twilight Blue, but maybe to a B uh, versus when I started looking at the race before I looked at the workouts, um, definitely a, a horse I, I thought could could run big in here and, and may still run big, but um Probably going to use three A's in here. It's going to be three technique, Folsom, and uh, untreated. And then uh, hopefully um, we can get uh, live uh, to the rest of the races. Uh, and then I'll probably throw in Silver Prospect, too. He he kind of runs a big – like that Sexton Mile race was really big on the sheets. And um, he's been given some time off. Steady works for uh, the best trainer uh, in the history of the game, uh, Steve Asmussen. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's – I mean, Steve, Steve is so good, obviously, but um, – in my opinion, I always tell people this, that if you're looking for a trainer with a proven record to bring horses up to a particular spot off of a layoff, I mean, there's no better guy to do it. So um, he's definitely one that uh, I'll either have as a B or a C, but I want to have somewhere on my tickets in case he's ready to pop a big one. Yeah, and it seems like he and uh, Ricky uh, Ricardo Santana are, are clicking again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's good to see and um, – you know, hopefully, um, you know, they're kind of doing the same thing with uh, their horses for the Breeders' Cup. I mean, they're freshening them up, pointing them for a particular spot. And like I said, um, really, there's no one um, in the history of the game that's got a better uh, track record of doing that. Yeah. Well, we've touched a, a little bit, uh, mentioning Epicenter, of course, Flight Line. Life is Good will be in the Woodward. We have the Awesome again. Those are the two grade one races this weekend. And then the Lucas Classic. Uh, which may or may not end up sending horses to the Breeders' Cup Classic, but this is this is it uh, for the preps, barring some weird thing, uh, you know, maybe a surface change or a stretch out if someone gets jiggity over the next couple of weeks. But uh, do you see Flight Line as invincible as I do? I mean, it it kind of looks that way. I mean, obviously that Pacific Classic was um, was really fast, and he did it uh, pretty easily. I mean, who? who wants to be the one to go with this horse early. I mean, that's the great thing about having speed and being able to carry it a distance of ground is because, um, you know, you, you kind of sacrifice yourself going against the horse like flight line who just yeah. does it so easily. And, and really uh, whenever the button needs to be pushed, he's there. Um, you know, I guess you could say that uh, a horse like Epicenter is going to have the advantage of training over the Keeneland track for several weeks. But uh, in this instance, it may not matter, but it's going to be fun and uh, can't wait to uh, be there uh, on the fourth and the fifth. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, not like I'm lining up to bet life is good at one to ten, uh, although he looks as, as centralicious as one can in a grade one against some extremely overmatched rivals but I, I do hope he runs off the screen because you know that just adds to it with flight line and baffer coming in with taba and of course epicenter we know steve would would love to have some feeling of avengement uh from the derby i'm sure he'll never get over it but a classic win and what would be horse of the year if he were to do that uh would would maybe ease the pain a little but all that said i mean it, I would bet flight line at four to five. Yeah. I mean, it's um, one of those things for me, it's going to be watching um, how the horse is training coming into the race. I mean, I'm sure he's going to train great, which makes things even more complicated, but um, yeah, I mean, you, if he's doing everything he's supposed to do and he's coming in great. And um, one of the great things about the big race days is there's so many cameras. So once he comes in, you get to see him gallop and um, any little thing, any, any little hiccup I'll be paying attention to. But um, if, if all is right and he runs um, a race like the Pacific classic or even better, I mean, it's, there's no one that's going to catch him. Right. All right. Well, uh, that is what, five weeks away. Uh, yeah. So for that big weekend at Churchill, Paris stakes on Saturday, mandatory payout Sunday. When are you on the mic? 
So I will be there uh, Saturday and Sunday. Um, Saturday and Sunday okay. Yes, yeah, Saturday we've got um, some really good races. And I just wanted to like kind of a thank you, just maybe throw out a horse maybe for everybody to kind of uh, long shot on Saturday, maybe just to kind of yeah. throw in your exotics. Um, the number five in race seven, Spielman for Keith DeSormo. Um, if you look at this race, um, as far as Brisnet goes, nobody's met the uh, the par for the speed figures in this race yet. So kind of looking for somebody that uh, might improve uh, this one going two turns for the first time, two seven furlong races. The September 24th work was pretty good. And um, this one has the pedigree to go around two turns, 20 to one on the morning line. So maybe an across the board bet, win bet, make sure you put in the multis just in case this one pops at a big price. Yeah. How about that? And uh, it's a pretty uh, snazzy pedigree, hard spun out of sassy image, who I think was a, a Romans. I think so. I think won the, um, the, the, uh, distaff, the seven furlong distaff race. Yeah. The, the, I don't know if it was the Humana distaff back then, but, uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but interesting, um, you know, it's been at Ellis and obviously showing up here at Churchill dirt, the only option, but you know, I see hard spun out of a broken bow mare and I do wonder about, uh, some other surface options that, that this one could have down the road, but, uh, Training well and getting to, to stretch out to the middle distance, uh, you know, mile and a 16th, two turns, obviously different than than seven furlongs, which this one's run twice already. But given what Sassy Image and Hardspun both accomplished, that's that's interesting with the uh, the workout positivity as well. So 20 to one, number five Spielman, race seven on Saturday. Yeah. And, um, you know, I like the progression too on that runner and, you know, it seems like Keith DeSormos kind of do, he's been a little bit quiet at Churchill. Um, just always kind of comes up with that one, two year old that kind of shows up out of nowhere. So, um, see yeah. if we can take a shot here. I mean, worst case scenario, I'm wrong, but at least at, uh, 20 to one on the morning line, um, you're going to get your money's worth. Absolutely. All right. Well, you've convinced me it didn't take much, but at 20, 20 to one, it shouldn't. Uh, Brandon, really appreciate your time and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do some work together for Breeders' Cup. Yeah, look forward to it. And uh, everybody tune in uh, Saturday and Sunday and uh, we'll try to give some uh, good reports from the paddock and uh, enjoy some great racing from Churchill. Love it. All right. Stakes double, plenty of good racing Saturday and then that mandatory payout. Carry over or not, it's all got to go on Sunday. So I know some people would prefer not to see it get hit, have the added money. But regardless, mandatory payout Sunday in the Derby City Six. Brandon, thanks again. Thanks, Ed. All right. He's Brandon Ahmed. We're, uh, well, he's with Churchill. We're doing this for Horse Racing Nation. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>